Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Um, I would like to start a new course. Uh, I call it Physics Plus. Physics Plus. It's presented on Unizor.com. Um, on Unizor.com there are other courses as well. First of all, there are a couple of prerequisite courses. One is Physics for Teens and Math for Teens. Both are absolutely mandatory um, before you uh, do anything with Physics Plus or there is actually Math Plus as, as, as well. And there are other courses like Relativity for All, for example. I mean, uh, all these courses are totally free on Unizor.com, so there is no advertisement, sign-in is not necessary, um, you might actually do it if you would like to uh, study under somebody's supervision, then I do need the ID just to connect the teacher and, uh, and the student. But other than that, if you just do it self-study, no problem, you don't really have to sign in. Um, now, uh, all these courses are presented, as I was saying, on Unizor.com in, in kind of two format, formats. One is the video presentation, which you just watch from the screen, from the, your computer. And parallel on the same screen, you have a textual description of the same lecture. It's basically like a part of the textbook dedicated only to the material of that lecture. So, I mean, if you will combine all notes to all the lectures together, that would be a big textbook. So I just divided it uh, into different pieces. Uh, each lecture has its own notes. Now, in many cases, I, um, I have exams. Again, you can take them as many times as you want until you will get a perfect score. Um, and uh, there are many problems which uh, I'm solving myself at the board. So uh, it's a very interactive kind of a course and I definitely suggest you to, to take. But again, there is, certain <coughs> there is certain hierarchy. First is Math for Teens, Physics for Teens, then you can go to Math Plus and Physics Plus. Now Physics, physics plus, plus is still classic physics. It's still something which existed, though um, it, it existed at the level of 19th century. Now, starting from the 20th century with the uh, development of relativity and uh, quantum mechanics, now this is contemporary physics. So, physics plus, plus is still classic physics. Now, let me just talk about this particular physics plus um, uh, course. First of all, I would like you to remind um, one particular uh, material, very interesting material, from uh, which, which I present in the Physics uh, for Teens course. Now, um, the Physics for Teens course has a part called Waves, and within Waves um, there is something which is called Phenomena of Lights. And one of the phenomena which we were uh, talking about in that lecture uh, was um, refraction, especially when the uh, ray of light reaches some border between two different mediums, like air and, and, and glass, for example. It refracts. And uh, we were talking about what is exactly a trajectory Let's say this is air, and this is glass, and this is a ray of light. It refracts, it, it changes the direction because of that. So the question is, if this is point A and this is point B, why the light takes this particular trajectory and not, let's say, this one or this one? or this one. So what exactly determines the trajectory of light? Well, um, some time ago um, a very talented um, mathematician and he had some other um, professions uh, called Fermat um, suggested a principle which seems to be a a very easy to 
kind of comprehend that the light will go in such a way um, that the whole time it takes from A to B is minimum. Now, why exactly there is a refraction here? Because the speed of light is different in air, in glass, and glass speed is different. Glass is slower, air is faster. Now, so what's actually the optimal, uh, um, uh, optimal trajectory? You can take a little longer inside the air and shorter inside the glass. Um, but maybe if you get a little shorter here and a little longer here, maybe the time will be less or greater. So basically the principle, Fermat's principle of least time is that the trajectory is such that the time is minimized. It's understandable, let's put it this way, it, it's an axiom. I mean, it's a principle which means uh, we, we cannot prove it except uh, experimentally. And experimentally, that's exactly what's happening. But it's kind of understandable. Personally, I don't have any kind of resistance to this particular um, principle. I mean, we always are trying to achieve something with, let's say, lesser um, amount of uh, efforts. I mean, it's natural. Same, same thing with nature. Nature is trying to, let's say, minimize its own waste of resources or something like that. In this case, resource is time. So, um, now let's go back to physics, to mechanics, to Newtonian mechanics. Now, Newtonian uh, laws are basically differential, something like we all remember F is equal to MA. A is acceleration, which is the second derivative of distance. So this is the differential equation, basically. Maybe when we are talking about how a uh, moving object is basically moving, uh, or let's let's formulate it differently, how the system, mechanical system, evolves with the time. Well, it evolves along certain trajectory. And as far as the trajectory, I'm not talking only about the coordinates, but also speeds as well. So, there are certain parameters uh, which are characterizing, characterizing the system. Its position, its uh, uh, velocity, I mean, these parameters are changing. And the system, as the time goes, basically is changing its state from A to B. So there is also some kind of a trajectory um, which basically kind of connects A and B. A has certain coordinates and velocities, and B, the ending state, also has certain coordinates of objects and their velocities. So the whole system can be described uh, as, well, the state of the system can be described as certain point in a certain abstract space, space of coordinates and velocities, for example. And development with the time, moving, let's say, of object within that uh, system, evolution of the system with the time, is basically a trajectory in that particular space. So maybe there is certain characteristic of an entire trajectory, like in this case, the time it takes uh, of the ray of light to reach from A to B. Same thing maybe we can apply to uh, mechanical systems, which are, again, moving from state A to state B along certain trajectory. And maybe the trajectory is such that it minimizes or maximizes something. So, that's a natural kind of thought, I would say. And um, if, if this is an axiom, well, quite frankly, I, I don't like it as an axiom. Because what is force, what is, uh, ac well, I, I understand what acceleration actually is, but why the force is exactly equal to this. I mean, it's all based on the experimental 
um, uh, kind of work of some people. The principle of maximization or minimization of something as the criteria for choosing a trajectory, well, personally, I, I don't have as much kind of problem accepting this as an axiom. It seems to me natural, in as much as it's natural to accept that the trajectory of the light is the one which minimizes the time. I kind of like it, even, if you wish. Now, same thing actually was the result of development of classic physics, cl classic physics after Newton. So, some people probably were not satisfied with this basically as an axiom. I mean, it properly delivers whatever the practical results are. No problems about that. However, again, there is some, something like a uh, not being comfortable with this as an axiom. And I, again, I personally have much more comfort accepting that trajectory from A to B should be such that it minimizes some quantitative characteristic of an entire trajectory. And this is, now this is a differential equation. Now, what I'm talking right now about the whole integral approach, because we are talking about changing of some uh, value along the entire trajectory, and trajectory is chosen to minimize or maximize that particular value. So that's what's very, that's what's very important. It seems to be more natural to go that way. But again, this was the first, and uh, somewhere at the end of 18th century, um, Joseph Louis Lagrange suggested what, uh, what, what I was talking about, uh, the integral method. The method uh, where he suggested certain characteristic of the entire system, um, in that particular case it was related to um, kinetic and potential energy, how it changes, etc. Uh, so, in any case, he has suggested quantitative characteristic of the system, and then it's supposed to be calculated along the entire trajectory, and the principle which he suggested uh, was um, uh, that trajectory is chosen, uh, the one which minimizes or maximizes this particular characteristic. So, extreme value, or stationary value, if you wish. Yeah, stationary is a good word. Stationary means it's either minimized or maximized, or there is actually a settle point. Um, that, that's all part of the uh, mathematics, calculus, etc. We kind of, again, I, I assume that something like calculus we all know. Obviously, all these things related to physics, physics plus, are based on um, mathematics and uh, calculus, vector uh, analysis, uh, vector algebra, all, all these are supposed to be known. So, uh, at the end of 18th century, Lagrange uh, suggested something which is called Lagrangian, uh, and again, stationary value of this Lagrangian defines the trajectory. So that's basically something which uh, we will learn in this course called Physics Plus. So we will build an entire body of classic physics based not on this, but on stationary value of Lagrangian. And we will come up to the same thing, actually. So it's, it's not contradictory approach, it's just another approach which seems to be a little bit more intuitive, I would say, but it delivers exactly the same thing. So these things are following from, from uh, stationary Lagrangian. Now, yet um, another development within the same kind of framework was um, by uh, William Hamilton, the, the Irish mathematician, and uh, that was in 1830-something. Uh, I think it was 1833. Um, so he suggested yet another um, kind of functional, another numerical value which depends on an entire trajectory. And again, stationary value of this particular um, characteristic delivers basically 
the same classic Newtonian mechanics. However, in that particular case, what's interesting was that it was based on energy, <coughs> which is very kind of a natural thing, and um, minimizing or maximizing energy seems to be a very uh, kind of, again, intuitively understandable point. And what's important is that um, his results, and his results was basically introduction of Hamiltonian. So Lagrange introduced Lagrangian, Hamilton introduced Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian approach was um, very, very useful, not only in building the classic mechanics, but also it actually um, helped to bridge uh, it was quantum mechanics, which we are not talking about right now. But anyway, that's just for you to, you know, to keep in mind. So Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics were very, very important. Um, now, besides everything, to, to do some calculations based on Newtonian uh, differential equations in many cases seems to be a, a very difficult, unsurmountable problem, whereas Lagrangian's approach uh, delivers the results much faster. That's another, basically, side of this, not only theoretical, but purely practical. So, uh, <coughs> so this course, Physics Plus, basically will be, um, at least in the beginning, dedicated to uh, mm, learning about Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. Uh, most likely I will start actually with some kind of a recap of Newtonian mechanics and then I will move to Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. So whatever I'm saying here is just some kind of a preamble introduction into Physics Plus course. And uh, so I hope you will take it and uh, maybe even enjoy it. Thanks very much and good luck.